fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. You may notice I sound like I have a cold. I'm just getting over one. But I'm here to talk with you about something today that has been on my heart, and I have looked for the best way to say it, and I have sought the Lord, and He, I could never think of this myself, but He took me to the book of Colossians and showed me how to show you this. Who is Jesus? He showed me how to answer that question for you, and thereby to negate all of the false teaching that is out there, just as it was in Colossae in the days of Paul. So I'm going to pray. You can go to the book of Colossians to the first chapter. Lord Jesus, thank you. You had your spirit show me this, and it is just such a perfect scripture to answer the question of who you are. So that those who hear and watch might see the real you, which has been hidden by all kinds of things from all corners and across every denomination of your church. You know it grieves me. I know it grieves you. You have sent me this day to speak of who you are so that your people, your church, might know the truth. Help me to speak this out, I pray, by your Holy Spirit's power. In your name, amen. So, who is Jesus? What have we heard? I'm going to be speaking from Colossians 1, 13 through 23. So I'm going to read down through, and of course there will be other scriptures sprinkled in, and Jeff will be busy doing a lot of scripture flags, those little red things down at the bottom of my videos as I go along and through. But I really, my heart is grieved, as I have said, because the church is flooded with many strange teachings about who Jesus is. And the Lord showed me that rather than attack or correct individual teachings, show them who I am, he said. And I said, well, Lord, how? <laughs> Where's the best place? And he took me here. I mean, there is a vast, vast array. And they are all completely contrary to the word of God. And they have peppered the whole church nationwide, worldwide. It was the same in Colossae, as I said, in the days of Paul. For many false teachings about Jesus were flooding that young church. Jesus was being misrepresented by false teachers. He was being demoted to the level of angel and many other things. But Paul did not immediately attack the individual teachings. He did that later. The very first thing he did, and we aren't going to really go down through this part, is from verses 9 to 12 of Colossians 1. He prayed for the believers Colossae, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what those verses are about. You can look at them yourselves, but he says filled in verse 9, filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, and it goes on and on, strengthened with all power. That's what he's praying for them. He would not pray it if they were already there. So why did he do that first before even speaking of who Jesus is and then dealing with who he is not? It was because 
when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are able to discern the true from the false. And that's what these believers needed, just like the believers said. Corinth and other churches that he wrote to. So, after he prayed, he said, here is who Jesus is, and here is what Jesus has done. And he went from there, Lord, says, that's just how I want you to address it. Let me read down 13 through 23. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If, indeed, you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So, we will take this apart now. When we see the he's, sometimes we wonder which he is being spoken of. But in 13, for he, that is God the Father, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's how we know that first he is God the Father. So we required rescue. That's the first thing to know. We required rescue. And this rescue was from his son. So his son, as we know from John 1.1, through three, his son is God, the son. That's why I never say anything but God, the son. Because people have said, well, no, but he wasn't really his son. And, you know, he was born just a man and all those things. So Jesus is God, the son. He is not like you. He was not like you when he was on the earth walking. He was not sent here to find out what it is like to be you. He is God the Son. We will see shortly that he is the creator God. I've read it to you already. Therefore, since he created you, he doesn't need to find out what it's like to be you. He created you. He knows what it is. He understands you perfectly. He didn't come so he could understand us all better. He was sent to rescue you, as I have just said, from the rule of darkness, the domain, the authority of darkness. Well, who is the author of darkness? Satan. It was under his authority that you were before God sent his son to rescue you from that darkness and bring you into his kingdom. Now, this rule of darkness indicates evil control. Again, Satan. He brought you into the kingdom of his son, God the Son. 
Since Adam fell, every human being is born under the rule of darkness and needs this rescue. Otherwise, he would not have sent his son. This rescue must come through God the Son, according to what this word says. We who are saved have been rescued from evil control. We who were walking in darkness have seen a great light, Jesus Christ, a never-before-seen light. God removed us from the rule of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of Jesus, his beloved Son. God the Son is king over his kingdom. If he has a kingdom, then he is king over it. Therefore, we who have believed Jesus Christ, we who have believed into him, have become members of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We are his subjects. We are his servants. So the servant of the king does not command the king regarding what the servant wants. But the king commands the servant regarding what the king wants the servant to do. And the king provides for the need of the servant without the servant having to ask. Therefore, those who believe into Jesus Christ and know who he really is, humbly approach him as his servants. We make no demands. We humbly pray for him to act, and we leave our prayers to him at his nail-pierced feet. And we trust him, and we obey all his commands. When we are filled with his spirit, there are two commands you must obey in order to obey the rest. And that is to stay in the city until you are clothed from, with power from on high and wait for the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. These were spoken to those who believed into Jesus. Jesus says, he who loves him obeys him. And God the Father says, If you do not obey Jesus, you do not love Jesus. And that's from John 14, 23, and 24. So if you are disobeying Jesus, you do not love Jesus. You do not really know who Jesus is because if you knew really what Jesus had done and who he really is, you would fall down and worship him and say, O Lord, I see my heart change it. Verse 14. It is through him that we have redemption, that we are bought back. And this redemption is the meaning in the Old Testament is marriage. Kinsman redeemer is often a name that Jesus is given because he is the one who redeems us, and because he took a human body, because he was born of a woman, he is also, there is that human component that was there when he was on the earth. When he was put on the cross, he redeemed us, that we might be his bride, his church. And redemption also means that whole process. The first thing that had to happen was the sins we had committed had to be forgiven. Now, in 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is the only begotten son of the Father, that is, God has only one son, God the Son. So when it says the firstborn of all creation, it does not mean that he was a created being. He is God the Son, and as John 1 tells us, 
He has been existing eternally, just as God the Father has been and God the Holy Spirit has been from before anything was. They were. He was born by the Spirit, not by man. Man had nothing to do with the baby inside of Mary's womb. That was a miraculous, holy conception done by the Lord so that the Son of God would be here as fully human and fully God. So Jesus was not born the way you and I are born. But when we believe into him, we are reborn. We enter life. Eternal life. You come from your mother's womb. You are born again into his kingdom. Born from above. He cannot be compared with the firstborn of a human family. That is, he is not the first child of God. He has eternally existed. He fully dwelled in a real human body while he walked the earth. He was not a ghost. He was not an apparition. But a person who was as alive as you and me. But at the same time, he was and is also fully God. So even when he walked the earth as a human, he was also fully God, and he was not like you and me. As the writer of Hebrews says, he was sinless, and we all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. So he is not like you. He is God the Son. Only through him do you have redemption, which not only means forgiveness of sins, but entering into this relationship of being his bride, the bride of Jesus Christ, spiritually speaking. Now, he is the image of the invisible God. When Jesus' disciple Philip asked Jesus to show the disciples the Father, Jesus said in John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen my Father. How can you say, show us the Father? He was the exact representation. He's the exact image of the invisible God. He is not in any way like you and me. He is exactly like his Father, and he was exactly like his Father while he walked the earth. When you see Jesus, you are able to see all of God's characteristics, his nature, because Jesus is God the Son. The Father and the Son are both God, both part of the Godhead of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son and the Spirit indwell you fully and permanently, John 14, 23. Then others are able to see the characteristics, that is the nature of God through you. You are not Jesus, but you are a representative, a living representative of him. You live and walk as he walked. You are not God, but the Godhead dwells in you, and therefore you have become partakers of his divine nature. From 2 Peter 1, 4. How glorious. How glorious all of this is that God would send a part of himself, his son, to you to die on a cross, that you may be redeemed, your sins forgiven, and you brought into a holy, intimate, marital relationship, spiritually united with Jesus Christ. Verses 16 and 17. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. This relates also to part of the meaning of the firstborn of all creation. 
That is, this son of God, God the son, was the creator of creation, all that you see and all that you do not see, both visible and invisible. The heavens, that is everything that you see above you, and the earth. By him, all things were created. Consider that you yourself can create nothing except a natural child, if you're a woman, and the man who inseminates her. He created everything, including you. He created everything as far as can be seen with the Hubble telescope and beyond. So God the Son is creator. Now, his father, God the Father, you can look at as the designer. And he handed his design to God the Son and said, make it. And so Jesus did. God the Son did. Jesus Christ was the instrument that God the Father used. God the Son was the instrument God the Father used. Thrones, dominions, rulers, whether good or bad, they were all created by him. Even Satan himself is a created being. The spirit-inspired writer of Hebrews says this, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions, that is many times, and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he, the son, is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. All things have been created through Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ in verse 16, the last part. Through and for. So he is the heir of all things. He created all things for himself at the command of his father. So not only did God the Father appoint his son to be heir of all things, but it was through Jesus that God made the world. So Jesus was never a created being. He is the creator who has eternally existed. He is before all things, having existed before anything came into being. Again, John 1.1 1, 1 through 1.3. He's the creator who the Father appointed to create. He's the instrument the Father used. Okay, so the heaven where God dwells has eternally existed. But Jesus Christ created everything between here and there. He created both visible and invisible things. He created those who rule. All things. And they have been created for Jesus. He is the heir to all that has been created. It belongs to him. Therefore, you are the creature. And he is the creator of you. You are the one he created. If you worship the creature that is the God of self, which we all begin by doing because we're born with a sin nature. If you worship that, God the Father will give you over to the lusts of that sin nature. And that's from Romans 1, 25 through 27. But he has given you a way out of worshiping the God of self. What I want, what I want God to do for me, what I'm demanding. Pleasing my own self, 
completely without regard to anyone else. He has given you the way out of that. By being filled with the Holy Spirit when the sin nature is crucified. But if you worship the God of self, you're worshiping yourself. You are a creature. If you worship a creature, he will give you over to yourself. And you will not see the light of him. I used to. But he turned me. He drew me. I came. And the God of self no longer is in me. I worship God the Father and God the Son by the power of his Holy Spirit. So it's possible to turn. Now, because he's the creator, you must know that it's not possible for you to create anything. You cannot cause things to come into existence by speaking words, even though you use the scriptures to try to do it. You are the creature. You are not the creator. He's the only one whom God has ever appointed to, to create anything. Jesus is the exact manifestation of God the Father, the express image of his person, his character, his nature. He has the Father's glory, that is, his character, his nature. He is not like you. He does not have your human nature. He has his Father's nature. Therefore, you can't attach human frailties and characteristics to him as if he has the same problems you do. Jesus does not have the same problems you do. He is here to resolve those problems if you will recognize that they stem from your heart. He's the heart changer. He is not, nor was he ever human in nature though he was in a human body, absolutely, as he walked the earth. He has always been fully God. And he was and always has been sinless, and none of us can make that claim. I was a sinner. I was. Then he cleaned me up on the inside, and I'm not anymore. This part is really amazing. From 17, the second half, in him all things hold together. So we know he is before all things refers to him being the one who created all things. Nothing was created except by him. And in him all things hold together. His word still goes forth. And therefore, you and I don't split into little atoms and atoms don't go flying off into nothingness. We are held together, and the whole earth and the universe are held together by his word. The word of his power. It's his powerful word. It's his miracle-working word. It's his command. By his command, everything remains as it is. So the earth remains whole and you remain whole and I remain whole because he says so. So Jesus Christ's power not only creates, but it holds together everything he has created. Humans do not have the power to create. But when we are filled with his spirit, he gives us power over that sin nature that snaps up everything that we want. Everything that worships the sin nature is what is the root of the worship of the God of self. He gives us power to work miracles. We are not him, but we are like him when we are filled with his spirit. And we do those miracles when he commands us to do them. Because we are servants and not kings, we await his command. 
Now, he is equal to God the Father, but he subjects himself to his Father. His Father has authority over him. God the Father has authority over God the Son. He can tell God the Son, go and create, and he will. He did. He subjects himself even though he's equal to him. He subjects himself to his father. And at the end of things, he will turn his kingdom over to his father. And that's from 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Therefore, all believers must submit themselves to God the Father and God the Son. For we are servants just as he served his father, even though he was equal to him. We are not equal to him. How much more should we only approach him and be for him servants? Verse 18, he is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. There's only one head of a human body. A headless body cannot live. If Christ is the head of a particular church, that church is alive. If he is not the head, if he is not the authority, if he does not rule in that church, that church is spiritually dead. It is by Jesus Christ and obedience to his commands and his words alone, only by that, that the body can live. If your brain wasn't in you, your body would have no idea what to do. If Jesus Christ is not in you, you won't have any idea what to do as his body, the church. If the body departs from his commands and his words, it cannot remain spiritually alive, beloved. There is only one who is the head of the church. That's Jesus Christ. He is also the head of the body, the church. There's only one who is your king. There's only one whom you serve. Therefore, no man or woman can be head of the church. Now, it is spiritually correct for the church to have those appointed by Jesus Christ as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers from Ephesians 4.11, but they must be under Christ's authority, his rule. False teachers are self-appointed, not under his rule, and mislead his body. Therefore, since they are in such vast number these days, much of the church is spiritually dead. Jesus Christ is also the beginning Literally, the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone of the church upon which the church is built. If that stone is not there, if his truth from this word is not the basis of any church, that church will fall. It has no ability to support itself. Christ must be that support. If the cornerstone is taken away or fashioned into what we think he ought to be, then that church who does such a thing will fall. Jesus said to the Jews who were rejecting him in Matthew 21, 42, he said unto them, this is from the King James, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner, the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He said this to those who were supposed to be the most learned of all the Jews. The builders rejected. That is, the Jews rejected, by and large, Jesus Christ. All of his disciples were Jews, and there were Jews who believed, but believers did not. Those who were experts 
in the law did not. Those were I daughters and T crossers who thought by good works they could get to heaven. They were not. They rejected him because he said, no, you can't do it that way. He is the head of the corner, the cornerstone. And if your church, if your denomination, if you yourself are not built upon that, you will fall. They will fall. He's also the firstborn from the dead. What does that mean? He's the first one to rise from the dead, never to die again. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he didn't physically die again. But being the first one to rise and never die, go on to his eternal life, which he had before anything was, means there have to be others. If he's the first, there have to be others who are going to have that same experience when their bodies die. There have to be others. Now, the others who will rise from the dead are those who love him and obey him. Their spirits will immediately rise to him when their bodies fall away, when their bodies die. And that's from 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Being absent from the body, you are present with the Lord. Your body has died, but your spirit has gone to be with him. And at the end of things, obedient believers' bodies will rise different than what my body is now will rise. But there will be that resurrection, too, from 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. But he was the first one. We die a natural death. Spiritually, we have eternal life. If we love and obey him. Now, Jesus Christ, this first place in everything, he has preeminence. He has domain. Every believer is subject to him and is his servant. If they are not his obedient servants, obeying his every command, then they are not his. Again, 1 John 2, 4. Verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Now, Jesus Christ was fully God. He did not need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to be God or God-like. He was God in the flesh. But for our sakes, that we may see his Father's perfectly right and wonderful plan for his church, Jesus told John the Baptist, to baptize him with water, and when he rose up, God the Father manifested, the Holy Spirit manifested, and Jesus was there. And this was totally remarkable to John the Baptist. The Spirit rested on him, didn't lift. Up until that point, the Spirit never rested on anyone. He came upon them, and then he lifted according to what the the Father wanted done. Now, this was the one. When this sign was revealed to John the Baptist, he said, yes, the Father showed me that this is the Son of God. This is from Matthew 3, 13 through 17. So God the Father and God the Son showed believers a picture of what Jesus Christ commands his church to do. Be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. Again, Matthew 3.11, Luke 24.49, Acts 1, 4 through 5. If those in the church do not obey his command to be filled with the Holy Spirit, they do not love him. Again, John 14.24. Those who love him, obey him. Those who do not love him, Do not obey him. Verse 20. It was the Father's good pleasure, continuing from the previous verse, through him, through Jesus Christ, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of 
his, Jesus Christ's, cross through him to reconcile, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, literally the heavens, not the heaven of God where everything is perfect. Through God the Son, Jesus Christ, the Father was pleased to reconcile all things to himself. This required Jesus Christ's death on a cross. Isaiah 53, 5 and 10. He endured the punishment you and I deserved for our sin, that we may be reconciled to God and escape his wrath. Reconciling all things does not mean that eventually everything will be brought into a saving relationship, everything, with God, even though they don't believe in Jesus Christ. It is only through Jesus Christ, only through believing in him, this wonderful gift that God gave the world, only through believing in him and into him. That is not just saying words at an altar, but leaving the old you far behind, walking through the door, which is Jesus Christ, and entering a whole new life. Has that happened to you, beloved? The scriptures are clear that salvation comes only through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ spoke of sinners going into eternal punishment, Matthew 25, 46. So, Reconciling all things, what does that mean then? If it doesn't mean that everything is eventually going to be saved, whether they believe in Jesus or not. This refers to the creation of a new heavens and a new earth, as it says in Revelation 21. 1. Now I looked this up, I checked the commentators on this, and this is what it means. It cannot possibly mean that everyone gets to go to heaven, whether they believe in Jesus or not. So Jesus Christ did not come to the earth to learn what it is to be like us. He did show us the Father while he was here because he was his Father's exact representation. His assignment was this. He was sent by his Father to be the reconciler that you must believe into in order to have peace with God. That peace was accomplished through the blood of Jesus on the cross. And believing in too means going through the door, which is Jesus Christ. John 5.24 and John 10.9. Then you enter eternal life. Verse 21 through 23, this was the condition of us all, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, I can testify that's what I was. Now, hostile in mind means heart. Many times, when mind is spoken, the real meaning is heart, your innermost being. You're engaged in evil deeds, just as I was. And yet he has now reconciled you, if you come to him, in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him, Jesus Christ, holy and blameless. Verse 22. Yet he has now reconciled you, who believe, in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So imagine the kindness of God. Think of it. Think of his great mercy toward people who rebelled against him, like me. That when we believe into Jesus and enter the door, which is Jesus, we are reconciled. It took his cross and the blood of it to do it. Holy and blameless thoughtless and beyond reproach, unable to be accused. That is his bride. That is a description of his bride. Are you holy? Are you blameless? 
Are you beyond reproach? Are you unable to be accused of any kind of evil? Have you been delivered from slavery to sin? John 8, 31 through 36. As he promises you will be. If you continue in his word. There is a condition for your salvation. If we read 22 and 23 together, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established, steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. If, so there is an if, you have to continue, you have to abide in the faith. Firmly established, the foundation of your faith firmly laid. And steadfast, Staying there. Not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard. Paul's teachers will move you away from that hope. They won't move you away from that truth. That's why he says this. To the believers at Colossae. Paul was made a minister of this gospel, which has been proclaimed to all creation. How? Jesus on the cross. No one could miss it. That was the proclamation. And it is yet proclaimed. The true gospel is, in some places, yet proclaimed, even to the ends of the earth by those who are filled with his spirit. Remember in Acts 1.8, he said, only then will you be my witnesses here. A representation, a living representation of Jesus Christ. And it will be from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. All humans were alienated. They were estranged. They were separated and actively an enemy of God in mind by the evil works that were in their hearts. Remember, mind and heart. And the evil works which they did because of what was in their hearts. Yet he has now fully reconciled those who believe into him and obey him. Remaining, standing, that's what that refers to, obedience. Accomplished by the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ. Why was it done? Why did he do this? So that he could present you to himself holy, holy and blameless. He will present you to himself holy and blameless and spotless if you continue in the faith. And the faith means complete assurance and reliance upon the whole truth that you are saved only by believing in Christ and not by any good works. And staying in the faith means you abide there and you obey him. He will present you to himself holy and blameless if you remain on the immovable rock of obedience to his words. If you obey his words completely, you will stand firm against all winds of doctrine and storms of false doctrine. They come in sometimes like a flood and have in the church all these teachers of false things who pervert the identity of Jesus Christ. And this is from Matthew 7, 24 
through 25, the rock of obedience to his words. So salvation is conditional because there is an if. Many say that it's impossible to be holy and spotless and blameless. It is true that it's impossible for you to do it, but he is very glad to do it. So it is not true that when you are saved, you are always saved. You must remain the if, if you remain saved. You remain saved if you do as the Spirit-inspired Paul has written and as he has prayed for the believers in the Colossian church, that he has prayed for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is how you stand firm. That's one of Jesus' commands. If you obey, you will stand on the rock of obedience, his words, no matter what comes. Again, how can you be made holy and blameless and spotless? In Ephesians 5, 26, Paul writes that Jesus will sanctify you and make you holy and spotless and blameless, and by sanctifying you, he will make you glorious. That is filled with his glory. Filled with his glory, his weighty presence, his kabod. Him and you, large and in charge. So, if you are not filled with the glory of God, then you have not obeyed his command yet to stay and wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So to sanctify means to be set apart. All believers are set apart from the world when they first believe. But again, there's that if they are not yet holy and spotless and blameless because they are not yet filled with the Holy Spirit. And I speak from my own experience. I surely was not, when I first believed, I was not holy on the inside. I was not in any way spotless. I was not blameless. If I had stood before him at that point, he would have pointed out many things in which I was disobedient. I was an infant in Christ. For 1 Corinthians 3.1. That's how we all begin. But it's when you obey his command to stay and wait that you become holy and spotless and blameless. That's what the word says. Peter testifies that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you are instantly purified your heart. Acts 15, 9. Holy, spotless, blameless. In the moment of time, Paul testifies that the sin nature is crucified. That is in Galatians 5.24. God does not dwell where there is sin. You cannot say that you are filled with God and at the same time sin. He will not fill you until you have asked him to cleanse you. Until you have asked him to do what only he can do in your heart. Crucify the sin nature. Purify your heart. Then he comes in. All in one fell swoop when he baptizes you with the Holy Spirit and fire. God does not dwell where there is sin. He dwells in hearts that are holy and spotless and blameless because they've been sanctified in this additional way beyond when you believe, okay, you're set apart to God. No, now he does something inside of you to make you holy on the inside. Hallelujah. This truth has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. As I said, when Jesus was on that cross, the truth was fully proclaimed. The great salvation which God offers all humanity was made evident to all humanity. As I say, like Paul, the Lord has made me a minister of this truth, 
a sermon who runs with his message on the beautiful feet that he has given me. It's all his work and not mine. Isaiah 52, 7, beautiful feet. But the question is this, will you believe the word of God? The Lord has shown me, and I've used my notes a lot because I have wanted to make sure that I got everything that he showed me. Will you believe this word? Will you cast away all of the things you have heard about Jesus coming to the earth to find out what it's like to be you, about him being depressed and having all kinds of human frailties? Even in some cases that he sinned, that is taught by false teachers. Will you obey him? Oh, believer, will you obey his commands now? If you do, he will make you holy and spotless and blameless, and you will be his bride. If you refuse to obey his commands, you do not love him. If you obey, you reveal that you love him. You become, if you obey, you become what he has called you to become, his living representations here, his witnesses. What a glorious thing. Think of it. He comes in, he indwells, he manifests through you. They see Jesus through you. You walk as he walked. You are as he is. This is certainly nothing I could ever do. But when you do it, you no longer have to worry about if you remain, you will. <laughs> He's in you large and in charge. There's no question. Is there a question for you? Have you obeyed? Have you stood on obedience? His words. If you have, you've been equipped to serve him and you serve him. He immediately puts you to work. And it's wonderful work. You delight to do it. But he cannot equip you if you refuse to see that you are unequipped. And if you've been listening to and continue to turn to the false teachers who have told you some of the things which this very clearly shows is false. Are you equipped? Are you filled? Have you obeyed? Do you have the ability to stay and stand fast? The winds of doctrine swirl around. He calls me to speak this today, that you might see the way to stand, and you might see him for who he is. Who is Jesus? All these things that I've told you. Lord Jesus, thank you. I never would have been able to come up with this in order to explain you. I pray that these words go out in your power by your Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for making it possible for us to be reconciled to you. And to even be a temple for your Holy Spirit and for you, Father, and for you, Lord Jesus. May this go out in your power, I pray. Amen. Fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his